and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest and craziest means possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. She is a a narrative a narrative designer. A very, a very art, a very ardent follower when it comes to all, when it comes to AR mat AR material, and so and somebody who is and somebody who is on a much more comfortable time zone than uh, than others. The one and only Christina Atanasowski. I'm hoping I got that right. Atanasowski, but you were pretty close. Yeah. How are, how are you doing tonight? Weather aside. Hey. I'm pretty darn good. BlizzCon, my first BlizzCon, so it's you know pretty exciting. I think I, I think I went to one of a few years ago, but um, don't don't um, quote me on that because all I can all I remembered from it was the main reason why I stay at why I stay out of um why I stay out of Cali during warmer days. Ah uh, yes, yes, that's gonna it's gonna be exciting. Uh. Well, the pro well, the problem the the problem is um, summer and I do not get along. I figured. <laughs> but I often like to start with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, and w and in your case, there's a c there's a couple of angles I can I can take with this. The first is is what what to what um. What tuned you into um ga into gaming and and fr and um furthermore, what was what, what what um what was the proverbial bug when it came to narrative design? Since that's for the for the most part your bread and butter. Hmm. Oh, that's so hard because it's like how far back should I go? Um. Ah, uh, I guess I'll go like all the way. So my dad is really into games. Mm -hmm. Um he brought the first computer that I ever interacted with. Um I played Diablo 2 with him for the first time when I was like much younger. And since then they were always just in my life. Mm -hmm. And then um once I got to SUNY Purchase, I ended up taking a gameplay and performance class and the class was kind of it was honestly all over the place because, you know, it's undergrads doing group projects, mm -hmm. but I realized I actually really enjoyed making games. So um, I just kind of kept doing it, making weird little LARPs and stuff until I was able to get a paying gig and one thing led to another and here I am. Mm -hmm. Now, the... the um... Now the concept of a of a narrative designer when it comes to when it comes to video games, um, that is something I did I do want to delve a bit into because I think a lot of people see see different positions when they look when they look at the credits page or watch the credits roll with a game that they just finished and a lot of them um, lean a little bit into the jargon end of end of things sometimes probably by intent, but. I'd like you to go into what exactly the duties of a narrative designer entail and where that would um, differ from a standard fiction writer. So it's a relatively new title. It's only existed for, I think, a little over a decade. Mm -hmm. And it means something very different depending on the project and studio that you're at. So um, sometimes um, there's a lot of writing responsibilities other times it's not so much writing at all and more about um, gearing the general narrative direction of the game. So whether that be um, talking to artists and like making sure everything's in theme or um, making sure that like skills make sense. Mm -hmm. it, so it's a range. And would you would you say that it that it leans more towards consistency ra rather than um, rather than what someone would typically expect from from a fiction from fiction writing? 
Uh, what do you mean by consistency? Um, make, making sure making sure that the that the overall t the overall um, tone of the narrative stays as it's as it's supposed to throughout the experience. And yeah, making sure that things stay in in theme and make mm -hmm. sense is pretty crucial. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was when I was um, when I was doing a bit when I was doing a bit of research in preparation for this, and I and of course I needed to double and triple check to make sure I ended up I ended up not getting similar names because that can happen sometimes. But I came across a role playing game. Ex um, project that you had that you had developed called divers and i'm curious um i'm curious if if um what sort of experience you had with with um ro with role-playing games up until that point we already mentioned like you've already mentioned your introduction with diablo 2 but i'm cur but i'm curious if you had a um a bit of a background when it came to tabletop gaming um yeah so i I was introduced to tabletop gaming during undergrad as um, basically there was this club, RPGA, Role Playing Gamers Anonymous. Mm -hmm. I had a bunch of friends who dragged me there for a vampire LARP, and I ended up staying for everything else going on, and also the vampire LARP. Um, and yeah, so we played a bunch of like WAD and like Burning Wheel. Um, some 3.5, some 5e, uh, Dark Heresy, and like a sh shit ton of homebrew games. I like this group already. Yeah. <laughs> Good time. Was was divers something that you, was divers um something that you had submitted as as something that kind of developed as one of these as you put it shit ton of homebrew games. So, <clears throat> Divers is actually a very long story about um, my master's thesis, but it ended up being uh, my master's thesis. I wrote it in three months, and yeah, um, make sure make sure your groups are settled when you're going to work on stuff, <laughs> so you don't have to like double back at the last second. But I'm really glad I did, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It was much more um, what I wanted to do. It's not. It's not like done. That's just the the version that was submitted. But still, it will never truly be done. Probably. Well, isn't there isn't there the argument that that it's never fit? It's never finished. It's always just good enough. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And well, when it comes to when it comes to role playing games, it's it's um. The phrase of it about it being ne about it never being done is a massive understatement. Yeah. Yeah. Some, ga some games more than others. Um. Yeah, just like going through it again and again with um like a highlighter and being like, wow, I really need to better elaborate on these systems and how they connect and everything. But. Well, an artist yeah. is their own worst critic. Yeah. But um another thing that I, another thing that I um found, that I found out in the matter was um gravitas which you just which you described on your itch page as papers please in space. Um and that that was made for uh, global game jam to um three I keep saying 2 years ago. Why do I keep thinking it's 2020? <laughs> 2018, three. I believe. Yeah, 2018. Um Talk to me about about how how you got how you got in with um, Global Game Jam and what the experience was like doing a um, game jam because I did I did one for tabletop a long time ago but I was never able to finish simply because of the of um timing. 
but yeah, that's my experience uh, with game jams. That's actually the only game jam I ever participated in. Um, well, other than like impromptu, I just feel like like messing around and like doing a thing with my friends, but like mm -hmm. a like official one. And it was a. I don't know how I feel about those experiences. Like at once, it's kind of cool to have. Well, this was back when you could hang out with people in real life. Mm -hmm. So um, we were all at the NYU Game Center and just like chatting and sharing ideas and coming up with stuff and like splintering off into teams. It was cool. But only having like, what is it? It's like three days to do it gets a little bit. It, it depends on like if if you're into that to be honest if that's like how you like to work some people can get cool shit done other people just kind of like burn out and like get a headache so um and something i did want to ask on that is cuz the um the tabletop game jam that i took part in we were we were given this we were given a um key, we were given a sort of keyword or a theme that we had to work that we had to pick that we had to work with and um we didn't get we didn't get it in advance when it it was mm -hmm. um picked at random for us did you, did something like that happen in your case or were you given a little bit more free reign no there was there was no notice they told us like the day of i'm going to look up what the theme was again because i don't remember um do, do, do. please continue at at the time at the time with mine i'd i'd gotten the I'd gotten the theme of tokusatsu, and, <laughs> and I thought, okay, how am I get, how am I gonna do how am I gonna do in a um a decent sized RPG in th in three weeks based on the theme of tokusatsu? Um, tell tell me what that is. Um, if you're familiar with uh, tokusatsu, is Japanese for special effect. Um, if you're familiar with a lot of kaiju works, your Godzilla's, your Ultraman, it's that it's in that category. As okay. well as smaller scale stuff like, um, like Com like Common Rider, Super Sentai, or Power Rangers here in the states. But that's the general vibe of what Tokusatsu is, and cool. it's been it's been it's been around it's been around since well since the day since the uh, since the uh, I want to say sixties is when the term started to get started to get wide use, and I'm pretty sure some some kaiju fan is going to jump in the comments jumping down my throat as as always that I got the year wrong. <laughs> um, oh, jeez. The it's it wasn't um it wasn't that I couldn't I couldn't build I couldn't build a game based on that. It was more of um the the um framing that the framing that they asked for in the whole the whole weekly updates thing isn't wasn't how i um operated and that was something that was something else i was going to ask what when you said you said that you had to do th you had to do the whole thing in 3 days was it a case where you had to su submit um submit at ti at times what part you were working on at a given time um no Really, because there was so little time to do it. I guess I don't want to waste your time by doing that with like check-ins. Um, yeah, you just basically have three days to like fuck around and find out. Wait, I'm sorry. Are we allowed to curse on your stream? I yes. Like... <laughs> the holy okay. one of the holy mantras is George Carlin's seven dirty words. So. <laughs> okay. Just checking. I got gotcha. you. But that's de that's definitely interesting. So, based on the way you describe it, it, so it sounds like, well, for all intended purposes, I ended up I ended up jumping on the wrong game jam. <laughs> it depends. It depends what you want to do. Mm -hmm. If you're like putting yourself into like super crunch, then by all means, global game jam the thing for you. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't I don't know about that. Um. Is when I think when I think of when I think of trying to do that that level of crunch, I think of the t I think of the times where I would just lock my lock myself in my office and and not come out for days, and um. That and I'd rather not have the coming out of the cave moment afterwards. Yeah. 
but yeah, that's now... how I feel whenever I leave my house now. <laughs> oh, the it it's a crunch just because of you know mm -hmm. quarantine, but still. Um, I'm able. I'm able. There's a whole lot. There's a whole lot of forest around in my neck of the woods, so it's not and. Most people most people stay away from the forest because they're afraid of the geese. So it's not so it's not going to be a total loss if I end up wandering out in those areas. I just have to deal with the geese assaulting me again. Pretty um, vicious. Yeah, especially Canadian geese. Yeah, um, they do that. Here. Yes. Now, another th another thing I was curious about that I've um. I've seen I've seen a bit I've seen a bit of a push for in the last few years, but it's still it's still a little bit bleeding edge has been um, augmented reality. Um, how did you? Because obviously so, when I did when I did um, my checks, I had I had saw that you had helped you had a hand with um, the Waking Titan project for um, No Man's Sky. Yeah. And um, go ahead. Oh, just um, clarifying, they're alternate mm -hmm. reality games. Yeah. Um, j just because augmented reality games, people assume like AR, like like on their phone, like mm -hmm. like AR VR stuff. Just yeah, continue. All right. But what I was what I was curious about is what what tur what turned you to the to the concept of well alt uh, well alternate reality projects. Um. Where do you even start? I I guess I could like bring it back all the way to the Blair Witch Project, just because that that was kind of like OG, ARG sort mm -hmm. of thing. And then uh, once again, I'm sorry I keep talking about like SUNY purges and classes and stuff, but um, there's this TV show called The Booth at the End. And it's it's really good, and I decided to try to make a two week long, like, pervasive game on campus mm -hmm. based on that game for a project, and it ended up kind of being a shit show, if I'm being completely honest. But it ended up changing the curriculum, and then I ended up having to do another one for the final. But for the final. I guess it started to lean more into ARG, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Oh, this is this is kind of kind of neat." And then, um, that led into um, the LARPs that I mentioned before. And one of my friends came to um, the LARP I was running. He was actually an NPC playing the Goat Man for me. Mm -hmm. Not long after, he reached out to um, the company I used to work work for, Allison Smith, and he was like. There's these people I know, and I think that um, they do really cool stuff with you. You should meet them. And yeah, I walked out of that random Skype meeting with like a new career. So <laughs> now, with that pro with that initial project, you when you said that it was a, a shit show, was it a case of just um sket? A lot of problems in scheduling, or what was it that made it a shit show, and what were the um, big learning experiences you took from that first attempt? Okay, so one thing I learned is that players, um, they don't like choosing not to do things. Is I I guess how I can explain it. Um, basically, the game revolved around doing things that would essentially really benefit someone else, but mm -hmm. it was weirdly interconnected um a couple ended up almost breaking up over the game because one of them had to admit it, um a crush they had on someone else and that was wild just realizing the kind of impact that like something something as dumb as like a class project game could have on people i can i can definitely see that um and as far as far as the whole play, players not like not liking to choose not to do something, yeah, that's, they know that what they a... are supposed to do, and they don't want to do it, but they want to keep going essentially. As some as somebody who has who has D, who has DM'd more games than he than he cares to reasonably admit, 
I know exactly that feeling. <laughs> what is your favorite game? Like, to DM? <sighs> um, that's, that is actually a, vi that's actually a much harder question for me to answer. Sim simply, beca simply because the best way, the best thing that I could say is it ultimately depends on who I have at my table. Um, Do you have an ideal table in, like, in your mind? Not necessarily. Um, before, before, before I had moved out to where I currently am, I used to, um, I used to do the, used to do these helper one shots at my LGS, where I'd help, I'd help them set up. And a lot of times, I had absolutely no clue who was going to be at my table. So something I ended up learning the hard way was to ta was to try and tailor my experiences be as best I could to the people who are going to be there, and just and just try my best to not fall into certain habits, which is which is kind of ironic because I ended up creating new habits while trying to avoid other habits. <laughs> but generally generally speaking the consistent part is that i try is i try and be very ha very um hands on and making sure that making sure that everybody knows what what the to what the tone of what they're dealing with is and what what's going to be favored what's going to be disfavored i remember a um i remember a piece being written about th about and I'm not sure if you had seen something similar to this, but three questions that a designer had to answer. The first is, what is your game about? Then, how does it go about being that? And the third is, what behaviors do you try and encourage and discourage? Mm -hmm. um, I'd found out about it when John Wick had brought had brought that up in one of his projects. No, not the not the one in the movies. Different John Wick. Just have to make just have to make that clear. Oh, imagine it's Keanu, please. <laughs> Unfor unfortunately, no. This particular instance pred predates that predates those movies. So no, I was I was not. <laughs> as funny as it would be to to have the revelation of Keanu Reeves being a being a closet game designer, that's not happening. Um. I will at I will ad, I will admit that I pref, that I prefer I prefer games that have a um have a defined have a defined theme as of what of what they're trying to do. Like I I like in my approach to a tailor. Okay. So you're not going to see me you're not going to see me um GM a lot of universal games. Nothing against nothing, stuff like you know, um, Hero System, GURPS. Dear God, I'm not touching GURPS anytime soon. Or that that kind of approach where, it where the theme can be just about anything. But the problem is, it spreads itself too thin for me. It's fair. Um. Now. Given now, uh, given that, given that, given the experience that you've had with um, al with alternate reality, um, eh, would you, would it be fair would it be fair to say that the that one of the biggest teachers you've had when it comes to what to do and what not to do with alternate reality was your experience with LARPs? Hmm. Yes, yes, very much so. Like uh, LARP and tabletop very much mm -hmm. influenced it. Um, I'm trying to think of a way of describing the distinction or something for like. I I, I guess it's like similar principles, but just since it's applied in such a different way you have to consider um like different kinds of players that mm -hmm. you're not 
like seeing at the table with you. So that really changes how you have to organize and plan. And when it com when it comes to when it comes to uh, planning, um, I've seen I've I I look at I look at the way that sort of thing is se is set up, and then and ha and how people will, how people will write adventures. Um, when you when does when designing the narrative for an for an alternate reality, um, do you have do you have do you have a do you have a set story in mind, or do you cons or do you when you're constructing the um, narrative, is it more of a series of bullet points? It depends on the project. Um, sometimes it's more uh, like. Yeah, some, sometimes um, the touch points of like what needs to happen are far more set in stone mm -hmm. than others when you could kind of follow the players as a, like, um, my, my partner and I call it like petting the llamas. Like if they're really into something, find a way to like use that to get them back into like what's going on, like feed into what they're interested in to mm -hmm. keep them engaged. And have the has has when it comes to um when it comes to finding what to keep them engaged is it a lot of trial and error? Um, to some extent, but they'll usually let you know like what they are engaging with, mm -hmm. and it's really about paying attention to your players, and not just on like the Discord or whatever, but. Mm -hmm following them over to reddit or whatever seeing what they're saying yeah um now when it now um some one thing one thing that i ha that i have noticed with a lot of um with a lot of alternate reality uh, motifs that i've that i've seen over the years which a long time ago, I joked it. I joked in, into calling the video game version of of how to host a murder. <laughs> but I can't help but I can't help but notice that a lot of them lean more towards unra um, unraveling um, mysteries in some in some form or another. Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you um... do you think that there's the possibility in the in the future that a, that ARGs could ta could um, could tackle other forms of storytelling be beyond mysteries, or do you think that that's generally going to be the embryo? Um, I mean, it, it it definitely has the ability to. Well, I I mean, mysteries also like a lot of things could be mysteries, like there could be. I, I don't know, comedy mysteries mm -hmm. or horror mysteries. So that I, I feel like keeping that that aspect of it is pretty important for mm -hmm. keeping the players like involved in what's going on and like giving them a reason to keep interacting. So um, it doesn't have to necessarily come across as as like clandestine as they usually do. But I think that some aspect of the mystery has to stay. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not. Um, imposing getting rid of the mystery entirely. It's more of um, making. Ch I was more curious about see about seeing something like ARG exp expand its reaches with time. But you had you had done you had done some writing and puzzle design for the um, kit for the Kiss of the Revenant um, project. And yes. What I want to focus on with that is is puzzle design. When it comes to when it comes to crafting puzzles, um, what w what would you say are some are some um, general do's and don'ts to make sure to make sure that puzzles don't get too don't don't get too daunting. I.e. Um, I.e. What what would you say are some of the pitfalls that that um people get can get trapped into with puzzle design? Okay. 
Um, so the thing with puzzle design, I think it's important to like just say off the bat, mm -hmm. is um, with all these ARGs and all of these other like puzzle slash mystery based experiences or games or whatever, mm -hmm. it has bred players that are super, 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 super good at solving puzzles. Like on um, the MIT Mystery Hunt, if you look into that and those like it insane. Um so it's not really in my mind at least an issue of things being too daunting because people will solve it mm -hmm. and far faster than you want them to. Um I'm trying to think of any other puzzle design stuff. It has been a minute since I've actually like done puzzle stuff. Hmm. And I have I have my own guesses just from just from my own experience. The chief one being um, no hand breaking. Hand breaking. Um. A few years ago, I had I had asked some, I had asked some of my followers to help me come up with a t with a term for that is the polar opposite of hand holding. Um. The idea the core idea with hand breaking is when. You have a situation where the the solution to a given obstacle, and it, this doesn't necessarily have to be a puzzle, it's just some sort of obstacle in a game, is one that is far, one that is far too obtuse to figure out naturally without any sort of foreknowledge, whether it be looking at a um, let's play or looking at a guide or what have you. Oh, um, uh, that that really depends on like who your audience is and who hmm. you're targeting, to be honest, because also, like, what your timeline is. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, like, the Mr. Robot ARG thing. I am um, not. So someone cracked the entire thing before it even went live <laughs> a few years ago. So, I, I, I don't... I don't actually... Yeah, yeah so I'm not, sh I'm not too sure about that one. Mm -hmm. Really think about uh, who you're making puzzles for. I can I can definitely see I can definitely see that and it, and admittedly when it comes to the concept of handbraking um I find I find that adventure games are a bigger offender of that than um than some of the ARG um projects that I've seen If it, if you're talking about looking for like external like information to solve a puzzle like ARGs like across the board usually are guilty of that um with handbreaking it's it's more of that that there's no there's no way you could if it if it was a puzzle if an ARG had a puzzle that there was no that um where the solution was so was so hidden that that um that a re that a reasonable human could not be expected to solve it without um without knowing the spoiler that that would count as handbreaking and so far I haven't really seen it what what do you mean by the spoiler like um, in this context no know, knowing what knowing what the solution is in advance but uh uh i i mean that mm -hmm. that would be someone like cheating and not actually knowing the puzzle or yeah. or like how to find the solution uh things can seem like insanely Pie pie, stop it! Sorry, my cat's knocking shit over. Um, well, it's a cat. That's what they do. Yeah, yeah. I have to, I have to open the door for him. So I'm s sorry if there's like noise, but no um, yeah, you would you would be surprised unless the puzzle in and of itself is broken and you literally can't solve it. Mm -hmm. People people will find uh answers to things that should take weeks in a matter of hours. Have you seen an instances of that where, pe where people were um, dead sure that it would take a while to solve a given puzzle and ended up getting solved way quicker than anyone anticipated? Yeah, all the time. It happens like pretty, pretty constantly. How is how is that usually treated? Is, is it a case where people are surprised? Is it a case where people... Um, 
are a bit, are a bit panicked, or is it a case by case affair? I will say that the first time it happened, it was pretty jarring. Like the first time I experienced it, like at least, um, uh, basically there's this there was this one multi tiered puzzle that uh, my partner had designed for um, Operation Dawn Dawn Bloom, which was this um, yeah this Black Watchman ARG thing that we did on Discord. It was like mm -hmm. this experiment situation, and there were different facets to the puzzle, and we thought it would take like a week or two but then they got the first either one-third or two-thirds within the first two days mm -hmm. it took them a little bit longer to figure out the last part but um we you know had to double up on production schedules and everything to make sure that we had enough material to fill in the gaps and we also had like live actors so that really helped but Now, one pro one project that's that's def that um that I was cu I was curious about its particular um, creation, which w which was a collaborative thing that you had, thing that you were involved with was Fatal Error. Yeah. Um, how did how did that come about, and how did you get how did you get into um, designing a strategy board game? So that was actually um, an assignment. Um, at NYU for their master's program. Mm -hmm. And it was honestly the most wild time. Um, so we started making an entirely different game. It was a card game. There was this whole thing going on. And then two weeks into the project, we think we're almost done. We are told to swap our projects with another group. And we got, we went from a like fully designed to literally a row with lines and a pawn to move and that was it and then um i remember saying i wish it was round and then we just started iterating and um one of the people on our team was like super into strategy games so mm -hmm. he helped us like get the math right and I love Fatal Error. It, it, it's a very, it was a very good time. And so, something else, something specifically that I'm curious about when it comes to the design of um, Fatal Error was the decision to make it asymmetrical. Now, I'm no stranger to asymmetrical ga games. In, f in fact, I'd say that particular mindset is on is has been on the rise in the last five years, but. In this case, was was it merely to was it merely to um to get out of a corner that was painted into when it came to the swap, or what was the story behind going um asymmetrical? So one of our goals had been to try to eliminate RNG, or at least like some RNG, because it just felt like uh the the player didn't have much you know, responsibility, I guess, in their actions, if they were just rolling for them. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to get rid of that. And um, we had just been playing Pandemic together as, as like a group, just like for bonding. And I think the asymmetric, well, that that's more like coopetition, but I guess that like bled into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and those were definitely like the biggest influences, I think. Which I, why we did that. Um, the now I will for this I'm for this I need I do need to give a bit of con do need to give a bit of context because just before just before I get into this next question, are you familiar with the phrase Ameritrash? Yes. All right. Um, if if you had to hammer it down, would you consider Fatal Error to have to lean more towards the Ameritrash school of thought, school of thought, or more towards a European school of thought when it comes to its design? 
Um, definitely more more Euro game. Which I can certainly see, since you um you mentioned that you mentioned wanting to get rid of our get rid of as much RNG as possible. Yeah. And... Come on, Bear Bear. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know why my cats are freaking the fuck out, but yeah, continue. Sorry, oh, I'm gonna just like I said, they're cats. Yeah, but he just yeeted like all of my Diablo books all over the floor. <laughs> so, um, thank you. All right. But when, what? Given what you mentioned with R with RNG, was there was there an earlier build that was a little bit more RNG heavy? It was the first or second thing we got rid of. Is Obviously, when a lot of people think of when they think of RNG in um, game design, they're probably thinking of dice rolls or something like that, or um, they're probably tra or they're probably traumatized in the corner. Which don't mind them; they're XCOM players. Yeah, I, I'm legally I'm legally required to make at least one XCOM RNG joke. So there you go. <laughs> but when I'm I'm trying. I'm trying to I'm trying to picture the sort of RNG that could that could happen with some with something like um like the fate like the Fatal Era project and I'm guessing it could become Candyland. Say again. It could become Candyland if the players are just rolling and that's like what like determines what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's just Candyland. Yeah. And even as a kid, I didn't find Candyland all that interesting. Yeah. Um. And but like, it's not it's not what we were really going for. Yeah. But when when it when it comes to when it comes to um when it comes the other part in the other part in that is the is the concept of um strategy and. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of back and forth about what about whether a game leans towards strategy or leans towards tactics, and how? Where would you define the strategy part with um, Fatal Error? Oh, jeez. I guess a lot of the strategy sort of lies in the deep play of it. And like knowing who you're playing against, and like going around that. Um, yeah. Bluffing. Um, I, I mean that's like one way of looking at it, or yeah, kind of also like cold reading people, being like, mm -hmm. like I I know you, I know you're gonna go here, so I'm gonna put a trap here. Um. That kind of stuff. Although I, although I could, I could see some people taking it far enough where it ends up feeling like a reenactment of the of the two of the two glasses, two uh, cups scene in The Princess Bride. I have never seen The Princess Bride or read it. I'm sorry. Um. Oh. You've prob you've probably seen it. You've probably seen it referenced in. Reference at least once. You just if you're if you're at, in any way inundated with um it, with internet culture. Um. But as far as far as reading it, I'm not going to hold that against you because most pe because most people haven't, and those that and those that have have probably read the abridged version. I've yet to find an unabridged version of it. Pretty sure it exists. I just haven't found it. Um. I now something else I did I did want to ask about was um Cyrano's story. Yeah. Um now if I now if, if I recall correctly um your your particular purview was screenwriting, um script editing and um talent. Yeah. Was do you cons do you consider Serrano's story, th um, the largest scope of a project that you that you had handled up until that point? No. Oh. 
like um i feel like if anything that that was one of the more chill things mm -hmm. that that i was working on scope wise yeah. and the other th the other thing is when it comes to when it comes to um screenwriting mm -hmm. um because whenever I whenever I hear if whenever I hear a phrase like that, I think of the um, stories about screenwriting when it comes to film. Um, how similar or different what was it comp comparatively? Um, for Serrano in particular, mm -hmm. it did not um, vary too wildly from just like plain old like screenwriting um uh when it came to like some of the puzzle stuff and mm -hmm. some of the the like lines that like de that the demon had or whatever mm -hmm. th that's where you you get somewhat more into the the mix between game and screenwriting because you have to like consider you know all the possible options and everything and like how to guide the player towards like the correct answer but the vast majority of it was just standard screenwriting all right now i real i realize that it's hard that it's hard to have a crystal ball about things but when it comes to when it comes when it comes to um something like it something like arg what what sort what sort of um what sort of trends would you do you suppose you could predict about about where about where that particular field will be going in the in the coming years i realize um, i realize that's a bit of an ask since nobody has a crystal ball but just based on where just just based on where the movements have gone in recent years where do you see where do you see it going um I definitely see it gaining more legs, um, especially now with like quarantine and everything like that and becoming more mainstream, I suppose. Um, such a loaded question, like in, in, there's so many ways, like in an artistic way, I know that someone was doing some uh, cool uh, ARG stuff over on TikTok that got like a, a ton of followers and everything. I, I didn't actually get to like play it though. Um, so that's really cool. I don't know if they're profiting off of that, but like it's really cool. Um, and then there's like the whole monetization, like conversation. And mm -hmm. um, there's these people who are spending like a lot of time and effort and like money to make a thing happen, but like, will it keep the lights on? So, so that's something to consider and that is a possibility for where things could go, especially if you look at stuff like Hunt a Killer. I feel like it paves the way for that kind of stuff. Nothing monetization is like an exciting thing to talk about. People act like it's a dirty, dirty thing to say, but I don't know. I I would like to eat, so I figured I'd mention it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes when when it comes to when it comes to narrative de narrative design um obvi obviously over over the over the decades we've seen we've seen narratives in games get get more um co get more complex but do you su do you suppose that it that um as t as time goes on, we are going we are going to see more screenwriting techniques apl applied to applied to narratives, or do you think it's going to um, evolve into into um, almost a subdivision of of writing styles? Um, what exactly do you mean by like a subdivision? Um. I guess the best way for me to for me to put it is like how someone who like how um jumping from fiction writing to screenwriting there's a lot of habits that someone has to unlearn 
and I'm cu I'm curious if when it comes to when it comes to screenwriting for um for a non-interactive work versus versus a um versus an interactive work if there's some habits that some people would have to unlearn. Hmm. Yes. But it, it also depends on the game, like what what you're going for, because the kind of stuff you're doing for The Last of Us wouldn't be the same stuff that you're doing for like um, Dark Souls. I don't I don't know. Um, I think I feel like a lot of people. Um, feel like they need to put a lot into the script and sometimes can forget that there's a whole like world that the player is walking around in and experiencing and that they should really take that into account and that's where it it becomes narrative design as opposed to just like screenwriting I suppose when you mentioned a lot in the script I will admit that some that something that came to mind for me is a as a case of a bit of a um, contested topic is the use of is the use of uh, journal entries, or so I... or some or some equivalent narratively. I mean, contested is an odd. <laughs> well, if I if I said if I said it's a scub thing, then I'd have to explain what scub is, but. <laughs> Are you going to explain what scub is? <laughs> well, well, the funny thing is, um, scub and is basically it ended up being kind of a shorthand for any for anything that is, um, divisive. It's based it's based on a on a satirical comic where you have two people arguing whether they're pro scub or anti scub at length, but it's never explained what the hell scub actually is. Um. But um, what I mean, what I mean by that is that I've um, I've seen a lot of debate over the years about the use of journal and the use of journal entries or similar narrative devices in games, where some people really like them and some people can't stand them. I and, think that's what I like the most about journal entries. If you can't stand them, you usually don't have to read them. Like they're usually there as like additional. You can read this if you care about the lore. But it's not like a unskippable cutscene, you know. Mm -hmm. I um, from my own from my own experience, I think I think the pitfall is when is when journal entries are um are a lot of fluff. I feel for the people who do want to read all the entries when they when you when they're put in, but there's not a whole lot that's really being said. And when you say not a lot actually being said, you mean anything particularly meaningful or just like sort of, I don't know, please continue. I'm, it, I mean, in, in instances where it, it, um, doesn't add or it doesn't add or take away from the, from the knowledge base that, um, that the, oh, play, so like that redundant the player has. Information. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that that seems like silly that someone wouldn't use the opportunity to expand on stuff. And if for me for me at least the if you're not um, if you're not using it to exp to expand on on what's what's known or give a new perspective on on what's known or throw that perspective on its head about what's known then it then it's the writing equivalent of junk food. Yeah. Yeah, just like I I guess if it's not adding anything, mm -hmm. then it it is just like some empty carbs. Yeah. But give given th given that I'm cu I'm curious if you if you think that um that th that we may be do you think that there's the possibility that we may be seeing a trend where um 
where the we're writing we're writing kind of is going is go, is going to be less of a lit, is going to be less of a linear narrative in a lot of cases and more and more of puzzle pieces as time goes on oh jeez um when you say puzzle pieces you mean like literal puzzle pieces that you have to like solve no not to no for... not, li or not mean, like, literal uh, just checking i didn't know if you meant like that or because we're talking about args mm -hmm. or if you meant like a, a from soft game where you kind of have to piece things together um i'm a, li a little bit of a little bit of both when i don't mean puzzle pieces in a in a literal se in a literal sense but more of more presenting the um or presenting a series of bullet points and having some and having someone piece together what the um what the narrative is i will admit that this is me that this is me um punching way above way above my weight class in this <laughs> I'm I'm trying to I try to make sure I like get which one you mean. I guess what I'm saying is do it I guess much like much like how I asked where um where where trends might go when it comes to when it comes to um narrative with ARG where do you see where do you see um where do you see trends going in the ne in the coming years when it comes to narrative um, design design as a whole, or do you think, or are there too many moving parts to really predict that? I feel like there's way too many moving parts. There's way too many different games. Um. Uh, one of these like styles or techniques isn't more valid than the other, so it really just depends on what you're going for. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm sure that both will like flourish. I mean, there is a lot of like cinema envy so i have no doubt that we will see more like super uh you know like cinematic like he heavy authored story situations mm -hmm. going forward but i don't think anything else is you know gonna go away because of that all right i get i can definitely get behind that um with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for take for taking the time out of your schedule to come up to the temple and indulge my my completely out of out of sanity questions. <laughs> fine, you're fine. <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether it, whether it's to discuss narrative or to ju or to just laugh or to just laugh at Mother Nature being Mother Nature. Or to, la or to laugh at cats being cats. The door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>